Plants and animals of Hawaii are the products of natural, ecological, and evolutionary processes. They are not products of some, some processes carried out by human beings. So why should the general public care about our native Hawaiian plants and animals? Because they're unique and because they're beautiful. Go outside and do stuff learn about the plants and animals and uh, spend time just sitting around watching them or, or visiting them. I have had my greatest times outside, even if it's pouring rain and freezing cold. Anyway, I got to do a lot of really great things. Go to places where other people haven't been um, and seen things that other people haven't seen. If more people could see them, and I'm all for having people see them outside in the flesh instead of, you know, in a picture or in a video. When people ask me what I do, if, if I think they'll understand the term, I don't say I'm a biologist, I say I'm a naturalist. And naturalists have been out of fashion for many, many decades. But no, I really do love birds. They're, they're wonderful things, but I like bugs and plants and snails too. <laughs> I'm Sheila Conant, don't have a middle name. I was born in Kapiolani Hospital, went to uh, Mary Knoll High School. Every Saturday morning, my two brothers and I would get up and we would walk from the house all the way up to Manoa Falls and back. We swam in the pool underneath the waterfall and we were always making collections of snails or lizards or tortoises or, or something like that. When I lived in Southern California, I think it was mostly snails and lizards, but I do remember spending a lot of time watching trapdoor spiders, which is kind of interesting because uh, when I spent some time on Nihoa in the early 1980s um, and Necker Island, uh, Mokumanamana, I discovered two species of trapdoor spiders, and it's just unheard of to have trapdoor spiders on islands out in the middle of the ocean, but they're really pretty cool. When I think of things that I remember from my childhood, it's always something outdoors. I think a lot of people who are the sort of biologists I am, naturalists or ecologists, do have these kinds of experiences in childhood, a fondness for outdoors or whatever their organisms are. Um, and I was definitely encouraged by my mother. By the time I really even got to college, I knew I wanted to be a professor, but I thought I wanted to be an English professor. And, uh, and then I took a couple of English courses and found that they weren't really very much fun. One day my mother asked me to take my younger brother to Sea Life Park, and we were wandering around the park and looking at the coral reef exhibits and watching the dolphins, and it just suddenly occurred to me that, well, I wanted to study animals. so I. I kept with my decision that I wanted to be a professor, but decided I wanted to study animals, and that really was a more natural thing for me. I always liked being in the forest a little bit more than going to the beach. So the natural thing, if you live in Hawaii and you want to study native organisms, you decide to study birds, and that's what I did. In the mid-1960s, the Oahu elapaio was still pretty common, and so I started studying the life history breeding biology of the elapaio, and all I had to do was walk out the back gate, down the street, and up into the woods. There were elapaio, pairs of elapaio nesting in there, and uh, it, I had a wonderful time. I'd just go out and sit in the woods and look for nests and watch the birds when they were at their nests, try to figure out what they're eating.
I couldn't help developing an interest in Hawaiian feather artifacts. In 1977, there was an anthropologist at the Bishop Museum, Adrian Kepler, who assembled a fantastic exhibit that she called Artificial Curiosities. This exhibit had objects in it that had been collected on the first voyages of Europeans in the Pacific. And the fascinating thing about the feather work in that exhibit was that these objects were collected at a time when there was little or no influence of continental cultures on the material culture. It became clear that the nature of the artifacts really changed considerably uh, as continental people came to Hawaii and uh, made their homes here. And some of the interesting differences were uh, that the diversity of feathers that was used in pre-contact artifacts was much greater than what we saw for at least uh, an initial period of time. So pre-contact artifacts had uh, chicken feathers, feathers from uh, Eva, the great frigate bird, especially the uh, feathers on the back of the neck of the male during the breeding season. Beautiful iridescent blue, green, black feathers. Uh, tropic birds, uh, flank feathers, the long uh, tail feathers, and there were some other other species of seabirds for which feathers were used. And then there is always the debate about, well, did the uh, feather collectors catch a bird, pull the feathers and release the bird, or did they catch the birds and kill them and eat them? Well, we'll never know the the perfect answer to that, or we'll never be able to quantify that. But I think probably that both things happened because David Malo writes about the different birds and how they taste it. This one tastes good and, and this one doesn't. I certainly have never thought that the production of Hawaiian feather artifacts took a toll on Hawaiian birds or caused bird extinctions, certainly not in pre-contact times because there were so many artifacts that had chicken feathers and tropic bird feathers in them. Uh, and even in post-contact times, when suddenly the, the Europeans thought, oh, these, these capes and these cloaks are beautiful. Uh, and the Hawaiians are got very generous people, so they made bigger and even more beautiful cloaks and, and uh, gave them away. Uh, the cloaks required far more feathers, so they had to catch a lot more birds. Perhaps if they used firearms, they, they might have done some damage. Uh, but I don't think that collecting feathers for artifacts caused the extinction of, of any of our bird species that are gone. I think that avian diseases and the, the transformation of habitats, if you don't have anywhere to live, you're not going to flourish. <coughs>
which has a beautiful, beautiful song. It seemed as though there were kama'o or o'u on top of every dead ohia snag in the swamp. And now both of those species are extinct. And the first morning when we woke up, the first thing we heard was the, the o'o. That's probably <clears throat> the biggest bird thrill I've ever had, to get up and, and hear that sound. The kama'o song is beautiful, but the o'o song is, it's just, it's hard to describe. It's a haunting quality, and there's nothing else like it in Hawaiian forests anywhere. Seeing those birds, the o'o is extinct now, the kama'o is extinct, the o'u is extinct. And uh, I got a glimpse of a kawai'i nukupu'u. Uh, did never hear it, so I, I didn't have a, a vocalization to confirm it. But that's now long gone too. So those memories just stick in my mind forever. And in the time that I've been studying Hawaiian birds since the mid-1960s, six or seven species of birds that I saw alive are gone now. Well, it makes me feel, well, very sad. And sometimes it makes me feel very discouraged and as though I want to give up, but I can't, I just can't bring myself to give up. To have seen that, I mean, I couldn't be sad that I saw it, even though I'm sad that the birds are gone. Uh, so I just feel very privileged to have gotten to see that. And then there are good things too. Just a few weeks ago, uh, another bird that I studied, the Nihoa Miller bird, was translocated to the island of Laysan. And although they've only been there for a month, there's a pair of birds building a nest. So I'm thrilled about that. So even when you want to give up, if you just wait a while, you get some good news. So people ask me why it is that I like spam so much. It's just because of my personality, because I think it's just crazy to go through life without a sense of humor. Years ago, a friend of mine sent me a postcard, and the title of it was, Four Ways to Make Spam Even More Delicious. Spam in a glass of milk. Hmm? Spam as a topping for your, for your ice cream. Spam with your breakfast cereal. And my very favorite, Spam in a Jello mold. I think it's one of those things that she made a joke of once that just sort of snowballed and then she started calling her lab Science Policy and Management, which is the acronym for Spam. And so it became this minor obsession of everyone around here to find the weird Spam products. And we had a potted meat pyramid in, a, in our office with canned pretty much everything from around the world for a long time. And I think the pig brains got botulism and half of it exploded. We sit around sometimes and we read the contents of the uh, cans and it just makes us laugh. The sense of humor and enthusiasm are really important in life. So that's the story behind the Spam Pyramid. And if anyone really needs strength to go out and conquer some difficulty in life, they can just stand near the pyramid and the strength of spam will infuse them and they will be able to go out and live a stronger life. Our most Pervasive problems are due to species that we have introduced, either intentionally or unintentionally. Feral goats, feral pigs, feral sheep, mouflon sheep, axis deer, feral cattle, all of these things have been terribly destructive to Hawaiian forests. They're not killing birds, but they're killing the environment that birds depend on, and they're uh, they are killing plants. They are causing the extinction of some plants. So I think those are the invasive species that I would concentrate on first. Something that would be 
helpful directly and specifically for birds would be controlling predators. And uh, I think right now for the birds that we have the best chance of saving, the single most important predator to control, I don't think we could ever eradicate them, are feral cats. And that's a very, very difficult problem because so many people are fond of their pet cats. I, I don't have one now, but I have always had a cat since I was a little kid. I love them. They're fine. They should live inside. Because when they're outside, it doesn't matter how much food they have, they're still going to hunt. It's in their nature. They're causing very serious problems, certainly with our seabirds and also with uh, whatever forest birds that they can get to. And then rats, that's another species that you can't really ever hope to eradicate. But it is possible to control them with um, rodenticides. If we could figure out when the birds are most vulnerable and then put our effort into controlling rats at that point in time, we might be able to reduce some of that predation. One thing that we could do is make regulatory changes that prohibit the introduction of new species of plants. We have fairly good um, controls, regulations about importing new species of at least large animals, but we have a very open policy when it comes to importing new plants. There are a few things that we can't import. Uh, we have a list of things that we're not going to import, but the way we should be thinking is um, we should have, instead of having a list of things that we should not import, we should have a list, and it should be very short, um, of those things that we can import. And, and they need to be things that are not going to become invasive. I feel really proud about the success of the Nihoa Miller bird translocation to Lay Sand, but I really can't take credit for it. I did study the bird in the 1980s and I did encourage the Fish and Wildlife Service to do this, but I didn't actually participate in the translocation, but I feel kind of like grandmother, you know, yes, the kids now have a new home and they're doing very well in it. I was proud to get to Nihoa. Going out there and doing all that field work, uh, which some people thought was hard. When I first started uh, being a biologist, there weren't very many women and there was a tendency for people to say oh well you can't do this you know because you're a woman but i just never accepted that sheila's very calm and very mellow and i think part of her effectiveness with people is that she's very small and unassuming but she does have a powerful personality and is able to kind of use that to her advantage to to get things done in a nice gentle manner sheila's one of those the really straight arrow good guys that tries to do things the right way. She has attracted a rather stellar crowd of graduate students, and, and um, she was given the Distinguished Service Award, not given to her just because she's, quote, retiring or any of the rest of it, but to recognize that she has had a long and continuing distinguished career. You know, nowadays, biology is just full of women. There's the graduate program in the zoology department for the last few years has had more than 50 percent women. I think women make really good biologists, but I think they make exceptionally good conservation biologists. They're not as confrontational, and so much of conservation problems, natural resource management, when there are problems, they're problems that have to do with people. When you're trying to save a species on the brink of extinction, you don't have that much time. <laughs>